We'll do that. I've got the poster. Hello, everyone. Um, we'll give a, another minute for other uh, people if they're still coming in. Okay. Yes, I, I think we have about 15, roughly 15 participants. Okay. And as a reminder, um, just know that this session's being recorded and we'll give another reminder in a minute. I think it's 147 now. Okay. Um, well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mitch Klett. Uh, my partner here is Susan James. Uh, I'm from Northern Michigan University. She's from Mansfield, Ohio. We'll show a slide uh, in, a, in a second. Just a reminder, this uh, session is being recorded. Um, the title of our session is uh, Protocols, Clouds, Air, Temperature, Relative Humidity, and Precipitation. And uh, our precipitation is in the form of rain. We also uh, measure snow and things like that, but that's not, we're not going to cover that. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, uh, um, like I said, I'm Mitch Klett. Uh, I'm in the uh, upper part of Michigan. You can see the arrow uh, showing that peninsula. I'm located right on Lake Superior. And my partner is from Mansfield, Ohio. You want to say hello, Susan? Yes. Welcome, everyone. And so I work in Mansfield, Ohio. It's about um, it's in North Central Ohio. So about an hour and a half from Lake Erie. So if you notice just above my arrow, there's another lake, one of the uh, Great Lakes, uh, Lake Erie. And so I'm about an hour and a half from south of Lake Erie and about an hour north of the capital of my state, Ohio. Nice, okay. Um, now, this is basically just uh, uh, session norms. We already know that all the mics are muted. Um, we will give a chance. We're gonna try to get a little communication going on later and we'll prompt 
our uh, um, help to make that happen. Um, if you have any questions, the chat feature is is on and you could certainly ask and uh, our, our help will um, let us know that those questions come up, okay? GLOBE's mission is to promote the teaching and learning of science, enhance uh, environmental literacy and stewardship, and to promote scientific discovery. But really what it is, is to build this, this collaborative, this worldwide endeavor, this uh, meeting of people from all over the world, teachers, students, scientists, citizens, all to share and conduct a real world uh, research. It's, it's kind of um, reinforcing that idea of citizen science, um, which has uh, been making kind of a, a big um, uh, appearance in the world of science. I know during this pandemic year, there was a lot of citizen science going on. Um, Globe's, uh, accomplishing Globe's mission uh, reminds students, this isn't a training. Of course, our, our, our role in this uh, endeavor is to kind of do an introduction to the protocols. Um, you, you, um, there, there is an e-training component, they're all online. Um, they're, they're pretty good, they're easy to get through. There's an assessment at the end. Um, it's, it's really worthwhile. And um, I, I'm under the impression that most people have probably went through the training. Um, Susan, do you have anything you wanna add on that or? Um, no, I just, I, well, yes, I do. I, I wanna remind everybody that if you look throughout the GLOBE website, you're going to be able to find a lot of tutorials that will help you, not only in the e-training modules, but throughout the, the website, there are a lot of, of tutorial videos. And anytime that you have trouble, if you contact the GLOBE help desk, um, the, the folks there are very eager to help and often will create a video, a tutorial video just for you in your situation. Uh, so definitely don't feel like you're going into this. Uh, if you're if you're about half of, of the listed participants are not trained and half are trained. Uh, so if you're one of the uh, yet to be trained globe participants, uh, don't feel like you're going into this alone. And once you really take that deep dive, you're going to find that the, the GLOBE uh, program is really like one big family. I've been to several of the annual meetings as, uh, as Mitch has as well. And um, we're, we're all looking forward to the time that we can, can meet in person again, because you, you form friendships that last you know, forever. Yeah, and I, I, will, I will attest to that as, as well. Um, I've been involved with GLOBE for many years. I, I would even say decades. Um, so uh, absolutely lifelong bonds uh, can happen. Um, ultimately, what we'd like to get through is um, going out and actually taking uh, observations so our students can ask questions and uh, develop uh, the skill sets that scientists have. And it all starts with with making good observations. Good observations mean good questions. Good questions lead to good research. Um, uh, a big component of what we're gonna do within uh, our session is talk about the atmosphere. Not all the protocols dealing with the atmosphere, but uh, the thing that I see the commonality is these are all really connected. The, these protocols that we're gonna be talking about today are really connected to, to weather and uh, some of the things that uh, even very early elementary students can do like cloud observations and measuring air temperature. Um, we'll end by talking about uh, the GLOBE app um, and how to collect data. I think we have a, a little bit of time to, to go outside or play with that a little bit. And uh, if we get some time, we'll look at uh, how the data is used to look at the big picture. Um, and try and tie it into the concept of earth system science. Okay. Um, 
So uh, the parts of the atmosphere that we're gonna be talking about, um, I'm gonna give just a brief introduction on the structure of the atmosphere, this very thin layer that covers our earth. Um, we also want you to become familiar with some of the protocols, including uh, air temperature, um, the relative humidity. That one is, I don't know how new it is. It wasn't part of the earlier protocols when I was going through training, um, but it was added uh, later. Um, in fact, GLOBE is consistently adding new protocols. I went through a session earlier today and uh, they were talking about protocols for microplastics. So um, very cool things are happening in the realm of GLOBE. Uh, we'll uh, do some cloud observations, connect it to uh, elementary GLOBE uh, through some of the um, books that we have for literacy and uh, precipitation protocols. And ultimately learn how all of these protocols contribute to Earth systems, as I said earlier. Um, so the note boxes is over the presentation. Do you fix that? Oh, you're right. My bad. All right. So uh, this is an interesting picture. Uh, you can see the photograph and uh, I'll take the credit. I didn't actually go up into space to take this one. I think uh, those people at uh, Virgin Air, Richard Branson beat me to it uh, to get up there as a private citizen. This is a, a project that we did years ago when I was in Idaho as a graduate student um, where we launched weather balloons into the atmosphere and uh, connected it to digital cameras and um, GPS devices, and we we're able to track these uh, moving over time. And the project really got me interested at looking at everything, all the components of Earth as a whole. Um, and in this picture, I chose it because we can see that the, the curvature of the Earth is very apparent. And uh, one of my students, these were sixth graders um, coming to a science camp at the University of Idaho, um, the, the student just looked at me and, and, and just, she had tears in her eyes and she was going, this is probably the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. And I looked at her and I looked at these pictures and I, I said, it's the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. So uh, um, that really kind of started all of this. Um, we can see the, the graphic on the right shows the exosphere, thermosphere, the different layers of, um, of the atmosphere. And we can see the, the very bottom layer, the troposphere, that's where weather occurs. All this uh, thing that happens, uh, happens in, a, in, in just a very, very small portion of, um, of our atmosphere. So um, Susan, do, do you have anything you wanna talk about as far as the, the structure of the atmosphere? No, but I do want to point out to everyone that if you too are interested in uh, launching a balloon for the purpose of gathering weather data, that is still a thing. Um, and I can point you to, there is a podcast by two women that go by uh, Vivify STEM, and they will tell you exactly what they've done to accomplish that with elementary age, or really you could do it with any age students. Uh, but there are actually kits that you can buy now that have all of the equipment and the do's and the don'ts and any kind of permitting that you have to have um, and thoughts about where you launch your balloon. Uh, it was really quite interesting. Um, so that's still something that, that you can do. And I know that um, NASA still uses balloons and kites to gather weather data themselves. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I know that uh, Dave Bailowski out of uh, Michigan um, has the Aaron's program and they, they use uh, um, kites in uh, their studies as well. Okay. It's an awesome way to introduce STEM, uh, actual engineering okay. component. Oh, the absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good program. Let's see. Um, well, I, I, I'm going to hand this off to Susan now. Okay, so um, 
And I do not have access to, uh, Mitch is, is running the show here, but when you get your copy of these slides, there, will, there are links. Uh, anytime that you see that blue text, you'll know that there's a link there uh, so that you can actually use the slides uh, effectively for your own purposes. So the teacher's guide is a great place to start when you are uh, trying to implement GLOBE into your classroom. And so every protocol um, has an introduction, it lists the actual protocols, and then it, they also have provided field and lab guides that are very helpful to, to give you the step-by-step -step of exactly what you're going to do once you're in the field collecting that data. Um, each protocol area has the data links to the data sheets, learning activities, which I would highly encourage you to use those learning activities before you go out to collect data as well as after. And then ideas for ways to look at the data, uh, different uh, suggestions on what you might do, okay? So I'm gonna start with air temperature and I'm starting with air temperature because from based on my experience, that's one of the more straightforward protocols that you can do with students. Obviously, the, you know, there's that lower grade limit of they, they need to be able to read a scale before you're, you're going out and, and measuring that temperature with the younger grades, for example, K to two but definitely by grade three and perhaps even lower, you should be able to go out and take a simple current air temperature measurement with a calibration thermometer. And that's what's pictured on the right. And when you purchase those calibration thermometers, don't just go out and buy any thermometer, you want one that meets the specifications for GLOBE. And so it needs to be armored. And what that means is that there is a case around it that protects it. Uh, there are holes down at the bottom where the bulb is. There's generally a hole at the top that you can either tie some yarn or maybe loop a, a rubber band through that because one of the, the key parts of collecting temperature data that people don't remember is that you don't wanna touch the thermometer itself when you're collecting that data because your body temperature will influence what the, the thermometer reads. And so some basics are uh, to, that you want to record that temperature for at least three minutes. And my rule of thumb is check it at three minutes and then check it again at four minutes. And then if it hasn't changed, you know that the thermometer has stabilized. So longer is better. Uh, you want to do that in a shaded area. And I know that in my case at my school, there's not very many shaded spots. So you might end up using the shade of your body, stand with your back to the sun and make sure that you're letting that hang off of your wrist and uh, in the shade of your body so that the sun isn't directly shining on that thermometer. Another way that is very handy to collect temperature data is with a max min thermometer. It, re it records six days of, of maximum and minimum temperatures. You do need to have that in a weather box though, an equipment box. The thermometer itself is less than $50. The weather box is more like 150. So you do need to keep the, your budget in mind uh, when you decide how you're going to collect temperature data. Uh, again, that calibration thermometer, about $15 is the easiest way to do that. And it's also the easiest way to put more equipment in students' hands because having them handle the equipment is a big part of learning science. Um, and so once you have your data, you can collect, you can upload that data either using the data entry app or the Globe desktop forms on the website. And now, as of today, we can even use the Globe Observer app. And I haven't had a chance to try that out. It just, I, I checked for an update last night and it wasn't there, but this morning it was, and I've not really had adequate time to, to check out that platform that they have now for us to upload uh, temperature data with Globe Observer. Okay, uh, next. Do you wanna go over your rhyme? Oh yes, that's right. So 
Uh, for those of us that are in countries that still you do not use the metric system regularly, <laughs> um, and and I am a stickler in my science class. I, I teach fourth, fifth, and sixth grade science at a smaller Catholic school. Um, I'm a stickler for using metric in science, and the best way that I've learned to develop a number sense in reading thermometers is with the rhyme. 30 is hot, 20 is nice, 10 is cold, and zero is ice. Most of the time, by the, by the time I've, ah, the children have reached my classroom, they have a sense that 32 is freezing. They don't really know what that boiling point is, uh, but they know that 32 is freezing. And uh, so we can begin that discussion with, you know, when does water turn to ice? and they'll always say 32 and I'll say, well, that's zero in metric. And so that helps to give some meaning to those, those temperatures. And I remind them often um, or ask them often when we're outside collecting data, what does that mean? What does that temperature mean? Does it make sense? Uh, it's very important that the data they collect makes sense, uh, that they're not just collecting numbers, but they're collecting numbers that have a meaning and that they can know in their minds that it is good data and not a, a stray piece of data that for whatever reason, broken column, whatever, it is not an accurate reading. Thanks for that reminder, Mitch. Okay. Um, okay, so relative humidity is one that in my experience, a lot of people haven't really ever collected relative humidity data. And part of that is because the, the equipment looks a little foreign. I, I, I have one here right here with me. Um, and actually, Mitch, if you go on to the next page, you're gonna notice that there are some different linear scales on one side of the sling psychrometer and then nothing on the other side. It literally pulls out, swivels, and then you're literally swinging it, slinging it for three minutes, minimum of three minutes. And that is why it's called a sling psychrometer. There are different designs. Um, there are some that have a wooden handle with a chain that goes to some very long thermometers. Uh, the kind most readily available in my area is, is this. You do need to, to take some care with it because those thermometers are easily broken. And you do have to make sure that the, the thermometer meant to collect the wet temperature. I'm not sure this is maybe a little more viewable than the picture. There is a little cotton wick that goes over one of the bulbs. And so it's collecting the wet bulb temperature, literally just what it is. It's a wet bulb. The significance of that is that when an object is wet and air is flowing across it, it creates um, hold on a moment. It creates convective cooling. And that's what is dropping the temperature based on the humidity in the air. So if you were, let's say 20 or 30 years ago, you would have taken the temperature, the dry bulb and the wet bulb temperature and used a chart. Now GLOBE actually does that calculation for you. So all you have to do is measure each of the temperatures of the bulbs, again, without touching the thermometers and type that information into um, either the app or the website uh, data entry. And it will calculate that percentage of relative humidity. Now the, the linear scales that I have shown here also allow you to line up the two different temperatures and calculate the relative humidity if you want to know that number right then. Not very many people in my experience take this measurement. It's not a common instrument, but it's really very relevant uh, because the satellite data for relative humidity 
is an average humidity over a very large geographic area. So it's hard for scientists to get real data for specific locations without people actually collecting that data and recording it. Uh, so yes, the satellite data is there, but it's more helpful for scientists to have individual readings uh, from a, a weather station uh, that can give them that actual data for that pinpoint location. Um, Mitch did remind me that if it's raining or if it's fogging, don't try to collect your, your, that data because it's 100%. So that's, that's when that water vapor condenses, that it condenses at that 100% relative humidity. And that is rel the measurement is relative to 100%. That's why it's a percent um, unit. You do want to collect this data within one hour of solar noon, and you're always going to um, state what the current temperature is with that when you re report that data. Uh, solar noon, uh, for those of you that might not be aware, is the midway point in time between sunrise and sunset. So it's not necessarily going to be noon. It's very rarely actually noon but you can calculate that or you can go on to uh, an app and it will tell you when solar noon is for your, your specific location. But one hour plus or minus uh, from solar noon is when you want to take that measurement. All right. Okay, next. okay so we would like to get you off of your seat. And um, the first part of what we want you to do though is find a piece of paper and we will want you to turn on your, your video, start your video on Zoom. We want you to draw a picture of a cloud, not anything that you're witnessing outside or observing outside. We want you to just draw the first thing that comes to your mind when somebody says draw a cloud and then hold that image up to your camera and we'll see exactly uh, what everybody's impression of a, a cloud is. And I, I've got a little post-it here, I'm gonna do that. Hey, we have some people turning on their cameras. Nice. I, I know firsthand, it's kind of nice not to have your camera on because then you can sip some drinks. Yep. And hey, I- Hey, Jason. Nice. And I'm not able to view uh, the whole grid. Diego, yes. Anybody else? Get, ooh. I'm not sure if that's <laughs> a Mr. or Miss Van Meter. <laughs> Helena? Okay, thank you, Helena? I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. Okay, so what we're seeing is what we expected. And this is a good activity to do with students. Um, so Mitch teaches at a higher ed level. He teaches pre-service teachers. I teach elementary students, but this is a fun activity to do because it kind of dispels the myth that all clouds are cumulus clouds. But that is precisely what most people think of. They think of a cumulus cloud. I drew one that is a little bit more stormy because that's what we've been experiencing here in my area. Um, for the last several days. J Jason threw us off because he teaches meteorology. He let us know that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he apologized. Uh, very nice. Thank you for that. Um, but yeah, in, in teaching, we call this a, um, um, uh, an elicitation. We, we want to find out what it is that the students know. What are their preconceived ideas? And pretty much everyone had a preconceived idea that clouds are puffy and they take on shapes. And of course this 
you could lead this into a classroom discussion, a very nice classroom discussion about um, seeing shapes and clouds and making connections where there's not really connections like, hey, I think I see Snoopy up there or I think I see a unicorn in the clouds. Uh, but those are all human constructs, right? A anthropomorphization. So uh, a very nice activity. Um, so Susan, tell me when to- Yes, advance. go on ahead. And oh, okay. I'm going to kind of modify what we had here. And I'm gonna ask you to wait to go look at your sky and sketch because we're gonna get you outside with whatever mobile device you might have as well. So in a moment, we're gonna ask you to go outside and actually sketch what you see. Doesn't have to be a huge sketch. Again, could be post-it size. Um, so go on to the next slide, Mitch, please. Okay, so the cloud triangle, if you are not familiar with the cl cloud triangle, um, definitely get familiar before you try to teach any kind of student, any age um, about clouds, because once they understand that different clouds, the names of, of the clouds correlate directly to the elevation of the cloud. And if you think about, you know, I can remember in younger years, always getting mixed up with, is it stratocumulus or cumulus stratus? And now it's not a problem remembering because I know that stratus is on the lower left corner of this triangle. So strato always comes first. Um, another easy misconception when teaching clouds, um, a lot of times people think that, oh, that, that's, a, that's a rain cloud. And they'll add that nimbo root word to the name of the cloud erroneously, um, mistakenly, because it cannot be a nimbo cloud unless you're actually seeing rain or some kind of precipitation falling out of that cloud. Um, and so that those are just a few little things that are, are easy to get mixed up. But once you go through the names of the clouds and how they correlate to the altitude of the cloud, it really does simplify it to the point where my fourth grade students were nailing it. Uh, so even younger students can, can contribute quite well to uh, cloud collection. And I have personally attended symposiums where kindergartners have done investigations related to clouds and, and, and have done a very nice job with their presentation. So I really like clouds. I start with clouds in, in my teaching because it's accessible to all ages. Clouds connects to just about every protocol area. And in fact, GLOBE recommends that you collect cloud data anytime you collect any other kind of protocol, protocol uh, data. There, is, um, there are some, some resources that are, are very helpful. The cloud ID chart, uh, I have a, at least a copy of the that cloud ID chart with each group of, of students. And the cloud cover and cloud type practice that is available on the website is just very, very good. So take the time to practice, even you yourself. Um, who did you say is a meteorologist, Mitch? J Jason Welsh. I'm not gonna argue with Jason. He, I'm sure he really knows his stuff, but most people, I mean, I can still even question, okay, is that mid-level or is it somewhere or just below or just above? Um, and so honestly, when Dr. C has, has come to, to help with trainings, we're like, well, we think it's this, but you never know. And so my point in case will be that just recently uh, during one of my GLOBE trainings, a participant emailed me her NASA satellite match. And she was very upset because she only saw stratus clouds. That's all she saw. Yet the satellite did not see stratus clouds at all, did not report stratus clouds, but did report some mid and high level clouds. And so we had a really good discussion about that because both reports recorded 100% cover or 90 to 100% cover. And I said, well, that's, that's more important in my mind that you're matching with the percent cover because otherwise one of you is very wrong. 
But we, if we consider that the satellites may or may not be seeing everything through both of those levels of clouds, and Jason's nodding his head, and all you're seeing is this blanket of stratus cloud and you're not seeing anything above it. So it, it prompted some really good conversation. And I even suggested she use that as a phenomena when introducing clouds to her students. You know, why did this happen? And getting them thinking about the levels of the clouds and, and you can't have a cirrus, you probably won't see a cirrus cloud that might be there, but you probably won't see it if your sky is totally covered with stratus clouds. Um, so it, it's just helping, uh, helping along that, that critical thinking of why would these two reports be so vastly different in their cloud types. And my, my participant was adamant that the, the satellite had to be wrong. <laughs> and I said, well, probably not, but consider this. And, and so that made a lot more sense. So I, I hope this little anecdotal story um, kind of resonates with some of you that, you know, when you're taking your cloud data, first of all, show yourself some grace because it's not easy. And use a chart. There is a dichotomous key that once Mitch starts talking, um, taking up the rest of this, I'm going to add a few links uh, that I've got saved um, on, a, on a document. And one of them is a dichotomous key that is very helpful because you're going to use the size of your thumb or the size of your fist to help determine whether that cloud is a low level cloud, mid level cloud, or a high level cloud. And using that dichotomous key in the cloud chart, I think are absolute musts until you've done this for several years. Um, just depending on how often you collect. Um, but I, I know that sometimes it's a challenge for me with all of my grade levels to, to get outside. Um, super regularly. If we get out once a week, we're, we're doing good. Okay, so I think that is, I mean, there is a lot of cloud science. I will post a link to an article. I think it was Jessica Taylor uh, did an article uh, about clouds and how they affect the weather um, and the earth system. So there's a huge amount of science that we could spend an entire day on. Uh, but that isn't the purpose of, of this training. So just know that, you know, the cloud, low clouds do tend to cool the earth. High clouds, uh, those wispy cirrus clouds tend to let more of the sunlight through that radiant energy. And so they're going to tend to allow the earth to warm. And um, it's a pretty complex system there, but it's uh, really cool to understand the earth systems. And hopefully if we have time, we'll get to that later. Okay, Mitch. Okay, the thing about clouds that that I really love is is the 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 naming of the clouds. Um, I'm I'm a, a bit of a word nerd, and the names that these clouds have all have their roots uh, based on uh, their their characteristics, as Susan mentioned. Whether they're puffy or layered, those all have a story behind it. Um, the the person that came up with this classification system, and it's inherent in the human nature to categorize and classify things just to, to make it easier for, for the, the layman to understand the world around them. Um, and they create these models that uh, they're able to, to, to use to get their, their minds in order. It was Luke Howard around the 1800s, he came up with this classification system. And it's interesting that when you look at the cloud charts, they're, they're written in other languages as well. Globe is very uh, good about having those uh, resources available. So um, did you want them to go outside now um, or? When we get to the slide after this. And so this, this slide um, just points out that there are there's an amazing set of, of books related to the elementary globe program or it's a sub program of globe um, and one of them is do you know that clouds have names and it isn't the entire set is excellent and my fourth graders last year were very engaged i've known of 
fifth, sixth, and seventh graders being very engaged with these books, even though they were designed for K to four. So just making sure that everybody uh, that has joined us is aware that these books, these resources exist. There's an entirely, yes, <laughs> I see somebody has kindergarten students tarantulas instead of cumulus. I love it. Um, and, and, you know, back in my day as, as a Girl Scout leader, um, Girl Guides to, to many of you, somebody pointed out, you know, don't limit children to having to memorize the names of things. Let them use their observation skills and give things names to them that make men have meaning to that child. And then they're going to remember what they saw much more readily than if they have to try to say, oh, I can't remember what it was called. Um, obviously, there's a point where you want to start learning those classification names, but that I, I love that tarantulas. I'll have to try to remember that when I'm working with kindergartners. Uh, but the, the storybooks with, within Elementary Globe are just outstanding, as well as the activities that they have designed to go with the storybooks. Okay, Mitch. And I think we're doing okay on time. We still have 20 minutes. Um, yes, we have a, a three minute video that I'd love for you to watch. This is Carlos and he is one of the United States student vloggers. So you might have recently received um, a newsletter from Globe talking about the new uh, student vlogger program that they have. They have one male, one female from each, uh, each country or each region. I'm not super clear on that, but I know that Carlos is one of the US vloggers. Okay. Hello, my name is Carlos and I live in the United States in the Bronx, New York. And today I'm gonna to be telling you guys how to use the Globe Observer app and what it's about. So the Globe Observer app is an app made by um, NASA, um, and basically it allows you to collect cl uh, cloud observations. And on their website right here, it says that by using the app, you're not only joining the Globe community, but you're also contributing important scientific data to NASA and Globe, your local community, and students and scientists worldwide. Now, so that means that you can use this to not only just help NASA, but you can also use it for your own purpose as well. Like I did for my science project where I had to compare um, cloud cover um, and how it relates to air quality. So if we have the app here, um, you can download it on Android and um, Apple phones, and it's just called the Globe Observer. Um, and you'll see a screen that has um, just a few different options, which would be the clouds, the mosquito habitat mapper, land cover and trees, and that will all be there on the app. So you would be clicking on the cloud op uh, option. So once you click on that, you'll see a bunch of helpful steps and it will walk you through what's going to happen. So we'll discuss what the program is about, how to use the app, what its purposes are for. And once you're uh, walked through, it'll get to the point where you have to take not only photos of the sky, which is my favorite part of the clouds themselves, but also clicking around and saying, and identifying you know, what clouds are in the sky. What are the ground conditions like? What are the surface conditions like? And that would all help um, the program to identify you know, what you're seeing. And if you're lucky enough, if there's a satellite above you uh, around the time when you're um, taking these observations, you can actually get an email where um, a satellite that collected similar data will try to compare with what you got. And then in that case, you could not only NASA scientists could use it, but you could also use it for your own science project like I did. So that's basically what we have for the app so far. Um, there's also different parts of it, as they mentioned, the mosquito mapper and um, other divisions of the app. But right now, this is just a cloud one. Um, it's really, it's really um, easy to use app. Of course, if you use it for the first time, it'll seem like there's a lot of steps um, and it won't seem as simple. But as, if you keep using it over and over, um, you can skip past some of the instructions because you already know it. And it's just a really easy process. Um, but again, the you taking photos outside, taking photos of the sky, that's completely optional. 
So if it's thundering or raining outside, you can still collect data, yes, from your house because those are options that they have the app. So it's a really versatile and accessible app. It's completely free. And um, the links to both um, the Android and iOS ones will be in the description below. And uh, that's all for today. Again, I'm Carlos from the United States, and I'll see you all later. Okay, did you you want them to download or? Um, well, if you don't have Globe Observer yet, we might not have quite that amount of time. But if you do have Globe Observer, take a moment and step outside and do a quick cloud observation. Um, let's take maybe four to five minutes. Okay. Um, at the very minimum, Take a small piece of paper out and do a quick sketch. Uh, write down what you think your cloud type is. Um, and it, just as importantly, cloud cover is just as important as the cloud type because the cloud cover is, is going to influence that urban heat island effect as much or more than the cloud type. Um, so keep that in mind when your students are wanting to do different investigations. Um, you know, we typically collect temperature and clouds. Um, we also collect precipitation and, and other data as well. But the very first thing students want to do is, is compare the cloud type to the temperature. And there's really not a whole lot that you can do with that. So, but your cloud cover versus the temperature or surface temperature, that can be something a little more doable um, with, with students, especially, I mean, even elementary students. Uh, we use the Globe Ob Observer almost exclusively at our school. We're blessed to have, be one-to-one -one iPad. And so rather than risk there being data sheets sitting somewhere that where the data has not been uploaded, I've chosen to use Globe Observer with my students. And it has been a game changer. We're able to get way more data uploaded to, to, for scientists to use by using this app. So I highly recommend it. So now it's your turn. Um, it is 2.32. Uh, let's take about four minutes. And because I have one more protocol to, to go over and then um, we'll be wrapping up. So let's shoot for 2.36 to, to return back to, um, and go on and turn your camera on so that we can, can see what you've got. Thank you, Jason. I love that encouragement. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll point out that, uh, and I don't want to say this wrong, it's Vesna. She's mentioning that there is a um, Padlet that is highlighting uh, elementary globe. Um, so it'll be a place where we can connect these links to as well. So uh, four minutes. Okay, I'm going to go outside and take uh, my globe data collection, okay? Okay, I don't, oh, we are like totally stratus cloud here. We've had rain at various times during the day. Yeah, so, I'll be right back. Uh, sure thing.
And hopefully folks are coming back in. If you're in but did not do a picture or anything, just kind of raise your hand and let us know that you're back. Well, if nothing else, Mitch, we've got people using the Globe Observer app. I think GIO would be pleased with that. Yeah, I'm trying to find out where, where my pictures for today are. I mean, I just took them and it is, it's bizarrely <laughs> clear out here. A, oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Uh, let me, let me try it now. Let's see. Um, I'm not seeing signs that very many people are back. We may end up like we predicted, just getting to the precipitation and wrapping it up. All right, so. Uh, it's, it's, it's extremely milky out there and. Yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty lean. Uh, if there are any clouds, they're they're way off in the distance. So, all right. Um, okay, I'm not sure how many people. Oh, Jason's back. A little closer. You have a, a statement on there, Jason. Success. Yay! Yay! Uh, I've got to tell you, I've had, some, maybe I share this okay. with Mitch, but my fourth graders would love to interrupt class by saying, oh, Mrs. James, there's a such and such cloud outside. Uh, <laughs> how I, can you get mad at a student for doing that? <laughs> I see some cumulus clouds uh, behind um, a van. Uh, what's your location, a van? Oh. Yeah, we'd have to, to chat that. The unmute, 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 unmute. Oh, I don't know how to unmute. Here, I can. unmute. Okay. Oh, wait, maybe this is it. No? Oh. Oh, yeah, now you can talk. No, yeah, I'm just outside of Philadelphia. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's all right. And see, J. Wow. Well, we're, we're in a system of like stormy, rainy stuff, like almost every afternoon right now. Um, within a half an hour of me yesterday, there were um, six foot, there was six foot high flooding and there was 0 0.01 inches in my rain gauge this morning. Wow. So they are really localized. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Well, I'm going to continue on. I'm not sure if everybody is back in, but we are running We've got five more minutes. Um, so the last protocol area that um, we've been asked to present about is precipitation specific to rain, not to snow. Believe me, measuring on a snowboard is a whole different beast. Um, so when you are taking precipitation data, there's a few things that, you know, if you've had a lot of science background, you're gonna know this, but if you haven't, you might not. Um, so when you're measuring water in a column, and I even brought, I've got my uh, measuring uh, column that goes with my precipitation gauge right here. I brought it home to clean it. Um, you really must measure to the bottom of the meniscus, uh, that little curve of the water at the top. Um, that is the protocol that you always measure to the bottom of the meniscus. Because otherwise you could be off by like, one millimeter on, on your, your height of your, uh, your rain gauge, the rain that you've collected. If you're going to record pH for your rain, which is very helpful to a lot of, of scientists um, investigating climate change, um, you have to have at least 30 milliliters of water. And so, and you're going to do it three times. So just bear that in mind that you can't really check pH if you've got just a little bit of rain. 
Uh, you're going to have to wait for a larger rain event to do that. Um, so 30 to 50 milliliters of, of rainwater is, is what you're shooting for. And you need to soften that water. That's, that's an important piece that people don't always realize is that um, you're, you're gonna have a more accurate pH reading after that water's been softened. And so you can either do that with table salt or with um, what I call rock salt. Um, and if you're using table salt, you're going to need to create a little salt card for yourself or print that out um, from the website. Thank you, Tara. And um, you're just gonna have a single layer of salt and you're going to use, as it says, the four millimeter for 30 to 40 mils of, of precipitation and the five millimeter for 40 to 50. Um, so ideally you're gonna measure this daily and you do have to record that um, around solar noon. So go on to the next slide there. So current temperature with a calibration thermometer, clouds and contrails, relative humidity, those can be done anytime mid-morning to mid-afternoon. I think I misspoke earlier. I think I said relative humidity was solar noon, um, but it's not. Your max min temperature and your precipitation though have to be done at solar noon or that two hour period around it. Um, so that we've got a certain time that you're always making sure that you've got that last 24 hours of collection for the maximum temperature and for, for the amount of rain that's, that's fallen. Um, that can be a little bit limiting depending on the schedule of your classes. Okay, and then all of this ties together with earth system science. And, and that's why we wanted to, to have that slide in there about earth system science. Yeah, we, we're running out of time. So yep. um, here's our contact information if uh, you need any of those resources. And uh, we will post some information to the- um, To that Padlet. padlet. Would and you? I think you'll also have access to the chat. I, I posted those links um, to the chat. One of them is a PowerPoint that I put together presenting the, the cloud triangle that you're welcome to make a copy of and edit as you see fit. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you, Jason. I appreciated the thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and, and thank you, A. Van Meter. Van Meter, yes. So, so and, and, and everyone else. Everyone else, exactly.